Yeah. 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 Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, NOAA display here in the Science on a Sphere. Uh, my name is Barry Choi. I'm with the NOAA Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, and we're going to talk a little bit about climate change uh, this afternoon. And I know it's a tough time slot. A lot of folks are having receptions at this time, trying to compete with uh, drinks and all of that. It's probably tough. First of all, I'm with NOAA, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Commission. And we, let's see if we can fix this uh, cutting out thing here before we get started. Better? Okay, the National Oceanic and Atmos Administration is under the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, within NOAA, there are the U.S. Department of Commerce, and within NOAA, there are of, uh, line offices. Uh, the one that you're probably most familiar with is the National Weather Service, where you get your weather information, you watch it from once. We also have the National Environmental Satellites and Data Information Service, National Ocean Service, National Marine Fisheries Service, our Office of Atmospheric and Oceanic Research, OAR, and there's another small office called the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, which within it has NOAA Commission Corps. So you see this guy in a Navy uniform up there, up here talking about NOAA, you're probably all confused. I'm not in the Navy, I'm in NOAA. NOAA has its own commission service, and that's the NOAA Commission Corps. And we, we operate the platforms for NOAA. That would be the ships and the aircraft. So the ships that go out to do the oceanographic research, charting, and all of that and the aircraft that fly into the hurricanes and do a lot of other things. So that's, that's my office there. What are we about, NOAA? Our mission is, a, just think of the three S's, very easy to remember, science, um, service, and stewardship, okay? So uh, we're in the business of understanding what goes on on our planet, uh, then taking that information and trying to see if we can figure out how to predict what changes we'll see in the future. And then sharing that information with others, that's that service component. And then, um, like we're doing today, and if you know what's coming, or you think you know, and you can predict it, and you see some train wrecks coming, or some problems that we might be having, what are you going to do about it? And so that's that stewardship piece. Whether you create a national monument, like we saw earlier this week, uh, with the expansion of the Marine Monument, um, all aimed at protecting resources and uh, making sure we have sustainability for the future. So, without further ado, this whole thing, climate change, we've been hearing this a lot lately, and I'm not here to change your mind on whether you believe it's occurring and what's occurring or not, but I'm here to just provide you a few tidbits or uh, evidence um, that our impacts as humans on the planet is having a little bit of an effect. So up until about two and a half years ago, I really didn't pay too much attention to climate change. I was, I'm a meteorologist. I only think about seven days, weather, 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 seven days, you know. Uh, and NOAA, beyond seven days, it goes to our climate prediction center. So everything beyond seven days is climate. Uh, but when I moved out here, uh, I'm assigned to the Pacific Command. And so the Pacific Command here is looking at non-traditional security threats. And one of the largest, uh, or the most hit upon non-traditional security threat in the Pacific is we hear about climate change, especially some of these smaller island nations. They're very concerned about having impacts of sea level rise and, and that sort of thing. So I said, I better go research this climate change stuff and see what it's about and, uh, and uh, see what I think. And uh, so. There's this, thing, there's this uh, organization, the International Panel on, uh, on Climate Change, and they got about, I don't know, 300 some odd scientists together, and they 
and they came up with a consensus on a lot of things. And uh, one is we're warming due to CO2 concentrations. Everybody know what CO2 is? Carbon dioxide. We breathe in oxygen as as animals. We breathe out carbon dioxide. When you burn fossil fuels, you create a lot of this CO2 as well. And um, a number of things are going on simultaneously. It's all like burning a candle at both ends, right? So not only do we have um, us burning fossil fuels to heat our homes or whatever, drive our cars and all that, we have a growing population. So not that even we have a modernizing population in certain parts of the world with lots of people. And so it's uh, this increase in uh, CO2 uh, burning of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels, which is creating a tremendous uh, greenhouse gas load in the atmosphere. And we can measure this. So back in 19, uh, early 50s, uh, NOAA, uh, well, this is before NOAA. NOAA was started in 1970, but our predecessor agencies, we had an observing site, two, one at the South Pole and one on Mauna Loa to measure uh, atmospheric CO2. And so most recently, we just went over kind of a big hurdle or, or uh, breakthrough of 400 parts per million, you know, steady, on, 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 on uh, Mauna Loa on the big island here. And so that CO2 acts as a, a greenhouse gas. So what it is, it really traps that solar irradiation and makes us uh, warm up. There are other uh, CO2, there are other greenhouse gases. One is nitrous oxide, and the other one is methane that we don't talk too much about. Um, and so this is kind of just give you a, a graphic, you know, the sliding scale from 2000 to 2016 of um, some CO2 uh, concentrations and the distribution of that on our, on our planet. Here's a good one from, uh, this is fossil fuel release uh, CO2, uh, of CO2. Let's see if I can run that one. And you'll just see it kind of building from uh, 2011 to 2012. And what you will notice, some of the concentration centers, one, in fact, I'll, I'll try to maybe rotate this slowly, but you'll see it, uh, the east coast of the United States, uh, where we have a lot of uh, concentration of, of people and in, uh, industry. And another one you'll see out here in, uh, in uh, uh, East Asia, high concentration of people and uh, energy use as well. So what's the big deal? We've been warm. We've, we've had the climate's been changing since pretty much the beginning of time for us. But if you go back in the paleo climate record and you, you look back uh, a few hundred thousand years, you see we've had warming, warming periods. And over, say, 5,000 year periods, we've warmed like 5 degrees C in 5,000 years. Well, in the last 150 years, we've already warmed three quarters of a degree. And maybe we look like two degrees by the end of the century. So we're warming at a much faster pace than we've ever seen in that uh, paleoclimate uh, record. And so what does that mean for us? Well, one of the, one of the things uh, that I just alluded to earlier was uh, uh, sea, uh, sea, uh, sea level rise. And so we can look back just in a short period of time from 1993 to 2012, and we can see the trends. And as you can see, I was just talking about those little island nations out there in the Pacific and their concern as a non-traditional security threat, um, sea level rise. And disproportionately, because of currents and whatnot, you can see that uh, the sea level is rising a lot faster out there areas that kind of uh, uh, are much more susceptible to the impacts. One, these are very low islands. Some of these places are the highest point is six feet above the water, right? So not only is there a threat for them going underwater, before that threat occurs, what happens is that, that salt water is getting into their freshwater uh, lens. They draw fresh water from, from down in the, uh, below the uh, atoll or the island and they suck that up there's a freshwater lens floating on salt water, and as the sea level rise, that gets in there, and it's like putting a, putting a brackish water. You can't drink brackish water after a while. It's not, not too, very good for you, and you start drinking salt water, definitely not very good for you. But before that, you have problems growing crops, because crops need fresh water to grow, and that's everything. So 
that's what some of these island nations are facing. Uh, we, we spoke with uh, the Prime Minister of Tuvalu and the President of Kiribati has already you know, made plans to, to buy some land in Fiji and if, if necessary move this population over, over to Fiji. So that's one aspect. Why is the sea level rising? Well, as the planet warms, the ocean expands. So right now, primarily, it's an expansion of the ocean. We've seen some melt, but for the most part, that the sea level rise right now has been a function of the uh, ocean, ex oceans expanding. Okay. Uh, beyond that, we have a lot of ice over land, like in Antarctica, Greenland, and those places. So everybody thinks, oh, we have uh, the Arctic Ocean, we have uh, all this sea ice. If that melts, is that going to raise the sea level? Well, not so much. You know, if you have the ice in your water and melts in your glass when you're drinking, does it overflow? No. But that ice over land, that, that water will flow into the ocean, right? And then that raises the sea level as well. Okay, a couple other things. Uh, as we warm, and I call these the... Uh, the, the cliffs, the cliffs that we maybe not know how far we are from, and things could happen maybe more rapidly than we we would uh, normally anticipate. So IPCC says, you know, sea level will rise something like a half a meter by the end of the century. We might be um, uh, maybe underestimating that to some degree. But first of all, some of those cliffs. As we warm, the permafrost in the Arctic and any area with permafrost in the northern regions there start to melt. And so that becomes a problem for structures that are built on them, but more importantly, trapped in that permafrost. Remember when I said we had uh, multiple greenhouse gases? We have CO2, nitrix, uh, oxide, um, and methane as a, as a greenhouse gas. Methane gets released. And so as that methane releases, what do you think is gonna happen? It gets into the atmosphere and it is much more effective than CO2 as a greenhouse gas, multiple fold more effective. I don't think we've accounted for, for, for that kind of release and how much is gonna come out into what's gonna happen as far as global temperature is concerned. So, you know, we may rise even faster than, than we think as that releases. So another thing that is occurring now, and we don't know what's gonna happen in the future, is a, a major sink, CO2 is absorbed into the ocean, right into the, into, into the seawater. Um, and as it gets into the seawater, it causes the seawater to get a little bit more acidic. And uh, not much. You're not going to stick your finger in the seawater and then you're going to pull up and just going to be a bone left. Not that acidic, but just enough, right, that it, it causes these little critters in the ocean to have a hard time uh, absorbing calcium. So what's your skeleton made out of? Calcium, right? Well, in the ocean, a lot of the living creatures, their skeleton is on the outside of them, ours is in the inside of them, and it's made of calcium. And so they're not able to build their skeletons as effectively. And some of these organisms, like the very, um, uh, I guess about the high levels of the food chain. First of all, you have sunlight hits the water, you get these microalgae uh, grow, these little critters eat that, these little uh, zooplankton. And those are the ones that have these exoskeletons that they're not able to make. So if that collapses, I call this another one of these cliffs, uh, the entire oceanic food chain could collapse because first of all, you have those microorganisms and these little critters that the little fish eat and the big fish eat those and then we eat the big fish. Imagine just not having any fish in the ocean. Right? We always have these talks about illegal fishing and I said, you know, you might not have to worry about uh, illegal fishing if, um, you know, there aren't any fish left in the ocean. So that's another one of these, these clips that we're talking about. So how much is the planet going to warm by the end of the century? So right now the IPCC says I think it's about uh, another um, maybe half, uh, three quarters of a degree or one degree. Um, the sea level will maybe a half a meter. Um, it, would be, uh, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to see a um, one meter rise in the sea level. And let's see what that looks like here, if I can pull that up. Uh, I got one here with you know, a whole bunch of sea level. That's the sea level trend. There we go. 
Okay, so we'll advance this out a little bit. So let's look at sea level today, current sea level. I think this one goes up in 10 meter increments. So as you can see, as we start raising the sea level, a lot of the earth starts going underwater. You gotta remember right now, the earth is made up of the planet, you know, over 70, almost 80% covered by water, right? So, 70% covered by water. And um, you can see some pretty large impacts as that sea level rises. Let's go look out in the Pacific. You don't even see any islands at that rate. Let's see if we back up and you can see some islands out here. Uh, middle of Australia kind of disappears or goes underwater. And, uh, that's 80 meters. Can you um, put up the one meter uh, sea level? It's the first one on the uh, on the list. If you go all the way up, you know when you put all the uh, A to Z up, it's the first one. It says one meter. Yeah. The reason I want to show you one meter is because that's plausible by the year 2100. So imagine one meter, three feet. You know, for other folks that don't do meters like me, three feet or so. And we can see what's underwater uh, at, at uh, you got it. Yeah. So everything in red would be underwater during a uh, one meter uh, uh, sea level rise. Let's go out here, and this is the uh, kind of the dramatic part. If you look out in the Pacific, you can see some of those islands. Uh, going underwater uh, at one meter sea level rise. And a lot of the, even the larger expanses of land uh, really go underwater uh, on the coastal areas during a one meter uh, sea level rise. If you think about it, that's not too far away, you know, by the end of the century. That's possible. Uh, and I thought, well, hey, is that realistic? So if we look back to the last interglacial period, about 125,000 uh, years ago, where the temperature was two degrees warmer than it is today, or about, we think. The sea level was about five meters higher than it is today. So, one meter is possible uh, by the end of the century. So you can see some pretty significant impacts. One place that was kind of interesting, I was doing a talk in, uh, in Dhaka, Bangladesh. <laughs> Bangladesh is the size of the state of Iowa, right? And it has half the population of the U.S. in that size, about 150 million people. And so I was, I was telling them this, that the sea level could rise a meter by the end of the century, and what would that mean for them? And the one guy in the audience, he raises his hand and he goes, Captain Choi, that means 12 million people will be underwater here. You know, 12 million along the coastal area. So, I think I took up my uh, 20 minutes, and I'll leave uh, 10 minutes uh, for questions, if any of you have uh, questions. And uh, thank you very much for your time. That's a good question. You know, that would be really uh, nice to show the, the density overlay. I don't think I've seen one of those in our in our data sets. Mostly our data sets are environmental data sets, but there's no reason we couldn't do something like that in the future. Yeah. Put a density uh, map on there. We do it um, for disaster management. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, uh, the Pacific Disaster Center, we use some of their stuff. Uh, what they do is they, they put a population uh, dynamic because the you know, populations change for the cities and then as a storm is coming through we, we do the part the environmental part uh, how far out from the center of the storm out how uh, hurricane force winds let's say and then tropical storm force winds and estimate the impact on the area and how many shelters you're going to need where who to evacuate those types of things uh, and how many people are going to be impacted by the storm so you've seen those things when you see on the news you see 
know, this many people are going to be impacted by this storm. Um, that's where that's coming from. But exactly what you're talking about, that is what it is. But, you know, we're uh, seven, mil seven billion on the planet, something like that, dusting to nine here pretty shortly. Uh, a lot of load on the resources. Um, like I said, burning that, that candle from both ends, we're, we're extracting the resources that also are, some of them are having uh, trouble surviving because of uh, the impacts of fossil fuels. And another one, you know, pollution is another problem. Uh, you ever heard of, uh, you know, they tell uh, uh, um, people who are pregnant not to eat, not to eat fish, right? Not to eat too much fish. You know, you know why? Mercury, right? Yeah. So you know where that mercury, a lot of that mercury comes from? The burning of coal. Yeah. That's how that gets into the ocean as well. So another good reason maybe to get off or try to limit the uh, fossil fuel uh, usage. It's uh, a lot of this stuff's available online. Uh, you're not gonna unless you build one of these in your living room, and you can. Some of you can. I know they're about hundred and thirty thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So this was invented uh, by a NOAA scientist at our environmental systems research lab, and it's uh, you know it's nice carbon fiber ball. I think it weighs about fifty pounds, a little over fifty pounds, suspended with the four projectors, but. Uh, it looks like magic, and it is, and it's good, uh, but there's a lot of technical issues behind the scenes on one of these things, like the, making those seams disappear. These cameras got to be very well aligned. Uh, like if you move this, if you move this little uh, shake this, it gets out of alignment, and then you can see the seams. Like that. It's just the atmospheric circulation, you know. It's, uh, but yeah, sure, you'll get higher concentrations in the winter because people are trying to stay warm too, and burning, uh, you know, burning more fossil fuels or even burning wood for that matter. Yeah. So, uh, did you want to see the one meter or the ten meter increment one? The red or So this is the one I had in my playlist, was the one I wasn't looking for. Oh, okay, you're just looking at the trends. Yeah, so this is the trend. This is only from 1993 to 2012. So a very short period of time, right? So Yeah, some places the sea level is actually falling a little bit. Yeah, but the proportion, the highest proportion, net rise, net is rise, net rise. And the uh, highest concentration arises out in that western uh, Western Pacific area there. No data. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's uh, you know that's where it's coming from. And then I was talking about the uh, you know we we talk about it as a non-traditional security threat. You know we and uh, so the U.S. military is looking at let's not. If you don't have to have any kind of conflict, then you don't have to have, you know, military hardware and you don't have to get involved and it's a lot of, you know, it's expensive too, you know. And so, if countries aren't getting along with each other for whatever reason, someone's fishing each other's fish or, or, <coughs> let's say the sea level rise and all these people migrate somewhere that they're not wanted or wanted but using resources in another country and then, you know, those are all sources for potential conflict and so we look at that. Yeah. There's some areas, uh, it's actually going down a little bit. Yeah. It's just the way of the, uh, you know, the dynamic, the physical dynamic properties of uh, what's going on in the ocean currents and those sorts of things. And even on a shorter time scale, you know, if you were here earlier, you heard my El Nino talk, right? So even beyond, um, I mean, in just your climate variability signal, you can have a pretty high uh, sea level rise and fall. Uh, so like I was talking about El Nino, you know, El Nino, the Western Pacific, has a higher sea level than the Eastern Pacific, right? And then when they're, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 
I shouldn't say that. Through normal conditions, the Western Pacific has a higher sea level than the Eastern Pacific. But in El Nino, that switches. And that, that change in the, east, in the Eastern Pacific can be as much as over a foot in some areas during just an El, a El Nino cycle. So there's been a, there's been some work on that modeling um, drought and areas that will get additional precipitation. So as we warm, the net net we should see maybe more precipitation because that you know more uh, water vapor and you know evaporation. But there'll be some areas with some significant drought uh, areas as well. The distribution of that is sort of still in the works. I think you know I, from what I've seen. It is some estimates that these areas will get more of this, and this will get less. But one one area that's 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 pretty uh, uh, interesting is disease. You know, you know we've already maybe seen some of this already. You know, we had a dengue outbreak in Japan I think two years ago. And, and, you know, mosquito-borne diseases as you, as you get warmer, the, the range of some of these insects will increase. Yeah? So as those range increase, you'll see some of these some um, uh, insect vector diseases. Uh, spread in larger areas, you know, uh, ticks as well. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, some if if you go back and study the Syria problem, that was due to well, some say it was due to that prolonged drought, yeah, and the migration, and so that caused the, the issues that are uh, you know that are you know, experiencing today. There in Syria, so yeah, I mean, can have a, a large impact on the movement of population and where people are going to live and, and such. Uh, we all got to eat, right? Um, there's a lot of work on it because we want to try to um, not have another Syria situation on the DOD side. So yeah, they look at that uh, very carefully. Hi, okay. I'm around if you want to 